Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of towering castles. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Kneeling. What's up, Paul? Jason Kneeling. <laughs> I Did love I how say you that know. weird? You, you ramped that up. You came I'm in Jason. soft and then woo! I'm Jason Kneeling. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I like it. Get ready. We're getting going, baby. <laughs> well, this is an episode to get pumped up for. Yeah. We're talking about a pretty cool place. The intro that I have written here is actually, I spoiled it at the end of the last episode because I was just going to ask you, like, Paul, why Matsumoto? Ah, yes. Because Matsumoto's amazing. It's super high on my list of places I want to go that I have not been to. Hmm. It actually, okay, throwing this out there, it reminds me a lot of Kagoshima. Okay. You know how Kagoshima is like a hidden gem that, you know, people go to, but not a ton of people, especially like foreign tourists. Sure, sure. It's roughly the same size city, and it has a really solid like two or three days worth of things to do that are just going to blow you away. I get you. I could see that. You got about two days in the city seeing this awesome stuff, cultural and historical and then, like with Kagoshima, you can go bike around the volcano or see the volcano. Here, you're in the Japanese Alps. You can go take a hike. You can go visit some smaller towns. Like You can have a day where you get out and do the nature and get some amazing scenery. I see what you're saying. And Masamoto has the benefit of being much closer to Tokyo, too. Yes. Much more accessible. Yes. Like I had to fly to Kagoshima, mm-hmm. which actually wasn't that bad. It was like a two-hour flight. Yeah, I mean, if you're really, if you're determined, you can get pretty much anywhere in Japan before too long, unless you really want to get out to those little itty bitty islands or something, or maybe down to, I mean, even Okinawa is not that bad, unless you want to get to the really little islands out there too. Yeah. But yeah. So Matsumoto is basically in the dead center of Japan. Yeah, it is. It's right in the middle of Honshu, the biggest island. It's in the middle, both north to south and east to west. It's true. It's in Nagano Prefecture. You might have heard of Nagano because the, was it 1996? 1998, I believe. Eight. If you're, if you're as old as we are, you remember Nagano Olympics? Yeah. So, so Nagano, the Nagano Olympics took place in Nagano City, yes. which is the capital of Nagano Prefecture. Masamoto is just a bit southwest from the city of Nagano. Yeah. It's about just under three hours by train to get there from Tokyo. City's probably best known for its beautiful castle. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Yeah. I, I really dug deep into okay. that castle. Okay. It's pretty cool stuff. Matsumoto has a population of just under 240,000. Which makes it the second most populous city in Nagano Prefecture. Next to Nagano City, I assume. Yes. Geographically, it's in the Matsumoto Basin. So it is surrounded by mountains. Mm-hmm. And is a great place to see some amazing natural scenery. We actually talked recently in episode 119 about some hiking in this area. The Kamikochi Yari Hotaka Circuit takes you right along the western edge of Matsumoto. That's the one that's like super advanced, right? You're like at the top of some of the highest peaks in Japan. That's one of the ones that is too scary for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one I was like, ah, that's cool. I'm probably not doing it. As for climate, they have hot, pretty rainy summers, and it gets fairly cold in winter with averages right around freezing. Okay, that's not too bad. Basically, I think of it as it's just a little bit cooler than Tokyo, just like a few degrees cooler yeah. th- throughout the year. Uh, Matsumoto economically has a silk spinning industry, yeah. electronics, dairy industry, traditional woodworking. Also, uh, travel. There's some hot springs in the area. It gets some domestic travel as an important part of its industries. And those mountains, those are popular. Right, right. Go to, gotta go see the Alps. And the history. I'm not going to spoil it, but oh my goodness, the history (laughs) absolutely surprised me and amazed me. Me too. I'm curious how much our notes overlap on that stuff. I tried to keep my notes like as short as possible on it because i feel like we could do a whole episode on that particular subject yeah 
but yeah, I dove like way deeper than I wrote in my notes. Hey, well, let's save it. Let's save it. Sorry, I got to right. Should we do our item of the week? I think we should. See, and I, I think it's. I just proved that I'm not a good singer. Gosh dang it. I was just going to replace that with the stinger that Oh, I thank made. you. Do it. Do that. Do that. I'm a good singer, guys. <laughs> maybe trust, I'll, maybe trust I'll put me. both in there now. Trust just... me. <laughs> Don't put them back to back. Or I could even have you singing along with the <laughs> stinger. Uh, okay. That may be make it not quite as bad. We'll do that. Okay. We'll see. Okay. All right. All right. Paul wasn't hearing it when he did that, so True. the keys might True. not line up. Yeah, I could. I, that's not my fault. No, not at all. <laughs> The point of singing is the joy it brings you, right? That is absolutely right. I, that part I got down. Good. So yeah, this is our new segment where each episode we choose one of our favorite items from our friends at Bento & Co. and tell you all about it. Uh, Bento & Co. is a website that sells all sorts of authentic Japanese bento boxes, cookware, food. They even have some Japanese antiques on there. Did you see that, Paul? I did. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, Paul, I think last time I talked about some stuff so i think it's your week to talk about the item of the week what's your item of the week yes my item of the week is leaf shaped green veggie cups green veggie cups when you're talking about green are these veggies that are green or are the cups themselves green the cups are green okay what these are are they're little leaf shaped green cups made of plastic is it plastic or rubber? Like it's, it's not a hard plastic. It's is a it? rubbery plastic. Okay. I mean, these are things that you put in bento boxes. I'm exactly. Assuming? They're little bento box dividers. Okay. And these have absolutely taken the presentation in my bento boxes to the next level. Did you already get your most recent order? I uh, no. Okay. This is wait. How many orders have you made now? Two. Oh, you. This was in the first one. This was in the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's just, it's so awesome because if I want to put some kimchi or something in my bento, that's runny. Now I put it in one of these little cups, it looks great, and it separates the sauces from mixing with each other. And they fit just perfectly in the little bento I have. It seems like the simplest little thing, but it makes my bentos look like 50% better. So is it like a silicone kind of texture or... A little bit, yeah. Like they're kind of floppy. Yeah, they're 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 movable. Okay. Dishwasher safe. You just throw them in the dishwasher when you're done, nice. ready to go for the next day. You get a, I think it's a three pack, so you get you can uh, make some really nice bentos. Sounds awesome. Highly recommend it. Keep your sauces separate. That's my tagline for this one. So if you want to get your own veggie cups, yeah, go to bentoandco.com. Use code sightseeing10. And you will save 10% off everything you order, and it will support the podcast. That would be much appreciated. You can also get a link straight from our website on the Support Us tab. And if you go through that, it'll automatically put in the discount code for you, and you don't even have to worry about it. Nice. Very nice. Bentoandco.com. Use coupon code SIGHTSEEING10. Well, Paul, you ready to get into the history of Matsumoto? I'm so ready. So Matsumoto used to be a part of an ancient province called Shinano. Mm -hmm. And actually, the capital of Shinano province was right right around here. Yep. The Matsumoto area, as far back as the Heian period, like over a thousand years ago. I have a bunch of stuff here just kind of about the history of the castle. Because, I mean, it was kind of a big deal because the, the town basically formed around this castle. Yeah, it's a castle town. So the origins of the castle go back to the Sengoku period. In 1504, a fort that they called Fukashi Castle was built here. In 1550, feel free to jump in, Paul, if I'm, I don't know, if, we, if we're around the same dates or whatever. Okay. In 1550, it was seized by the Takeda clan, who held it until 1582 when Oda Nobunaga rolled through. Probably heard of that guy, one of the great unifiers, the first one. Yep. He rolled through and defeated the Takeda clan. But later that year, Oda Nobunaga died. And then the castle was seized by Ogasawara Dosetsuzai, whose nephew, Ogasawara Sariyoshi, later pledged fealty 
to Tokugawa Ieyasu. Maybe you've heard of him, the last of the three great unifiers. So I just clarifying question here. Yeah. It wasn't yet the castle we see today, right? It was still like a fort type thing, right? Correct. Okay. But when Ogasawara Sariyoshi pledged fealty to Tokugawa Ieyasu, that's when the castle was renamed Matsumoto Castle. Okay. But it still wasn't exactly what it is today. Because in 1590, Toyotomi Hideyoshi came into power. He was the middle of the three great unifiers. Yep. He put Ishikawa Kazumasa in charge of Matsumoto. And it was that guy and his son, Yasunaga, who built the castle into pretty much what it is today. Okay. And that was completed around 1594. Okay. So, yeah, 1594 pretty much looked like it does today. So, pretty quickly after that, the Edo period began. The Tokugawa shogunate established the Matsumoto Domain. And the city of Matsumoto, well, it wasn't quite a city yet, but it was developing as a castle town at that point. Yep. And it just kept growing for a while and eventually, towards modern times, got incorporated as a city and took over neighboring villages. I feel like that's always the story of every Japanese city. Especially it, in the mountains, the little towns, like they just absorb all the yeah. stuff surrounding them. This year it annexed this village, and then it annexed these three villages, and it all glumps into one city. Yeah. Can I give you a little more history about the castle? Yes. Because other things happen yes. during the Meiji Restoration. So the castle changed hands a bunch of times between, you know, during the Edo period, essentially. But in the Meiji Restoration, the Meiji government went around tearing down a bunch of those old castles yeah. in the Sengoku period. So most of the castle structures in Matsumoto were torn down. But as they were about to destroy the main keep, the main building that still remains today, the townspeople came together to stop that from happening. That's right. People power. That's kind of a, a theme in Matsumoto, right? Yeah, that's cool. Um, they started a campaign to keep the keep. <laughs> and it was eventually acquired by the city government. Nice. Yeah. They also managed to save the daimyo's residence. The daimyo is, you know, the lord that lived there yeah. and ruled the area. So uh, his residence was actually then used as the prefectural office for Chikuma Prefecture. Okay. Have you heard of Chikuma Prefecture before, Paul? No, I don't think so. I hadn't either because Chikuma Prefecture was then about to merge with Nagano Prefecture to form the current Nagano Prefecture, and Matsumoto actually could have become the capital of modern Nagano Prefecture. But do you know why it didn't? No. That daimyo's residence that they were using as the prefectural office, it was burnt down by an arsonist. Oh, no. And apparently that is the reason they decided to make Nagano the capital instead. Okay. Isn't that interesting? It is. Nagano is a bit of a bigger city. Although Matsumoto, I think, is a little more centrally located in the province. Well, and who knows which would have been the bigger city if Matsumoto became the capital. True. You know, that was a long time ago. Would, would the Shinkan Sen the... go through Matsumoto instead of Nag Nagano? Perhaps. All of history would have changed. Yep. It's funny how here and there, one particular arsonist changes the course of history. Right. Not to inspire anybody. <laughs> <laughs> See what'll happen. Go burn things no, down. No, 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 no. <laughs> you may feel powerless in the modern age, but with a lighter, you can be a mover and a shaker. Burn down the right building and they'll remember your name forever. <laughs> this is a joke. We are not advocating burning things down. Unless Correct. it's very controlled and you own it and it's legal to do. Right. Keep okay. those historical buildings intact, please. Yeah, especially those. Um, so I have some other, I don't know, general um, stuff. The castle was designated a national history site in 1930. Mm -hmm. The remaining buildings were designated national treasures of Japan in 1952. Mm -hmm. We mentioned, or did we mention that it's one of the 12 original castles of Japan? I believe we did. I can't remember if in the intro, it was I in this think. or the, the teaser in the last oh, episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't remember either. But it is. It is. There are only 12 original castles. You know, that haven't been completely rebuilt. And this Matsumoto is Castle is unique among those 12 in a number of different ways that we'll get into more mm, later. I can't wait. 
Modern Matsumoto was established in 1889 and became an official city in 1907. Mm -hmm. Paul mentioned the annexing of a a bunch of surrounding areas. That was like throughout the 1900s. They were just gathering more and more surrounding little towns. Yeah. And Paul, I think you actually, before I'd even done my research, you pointed out this significant event that happened in Matsumoto in the 1990s. You ready to dive in? Let's do it. All right. On the night of June 27th, 1994, members of the Ohm Shinrikyo cult drove a converted refrigerator truck to a three-story apartment building at 10.40 p.m. and used a heating device in the cargo area to turn 12 liters of liquid sarin into an aerosol and used fans to diffuse the gas throughout the neighborhood. Within hours, dozens of victims were being rushed to local hospitals, suffering from all sorts of symptoms, darkened vision, eye pain, headaches, nausea, meiosis, which is shrinking of the pupils, apparently. A lot of eye effects. Yeah. Diarrhea, numbness of the hands. It was one of the biggest terrorist chemical weapons attacks in the history of the world. That's crazy. It happened to Matsumoto, and I'd never heard of it. Yeah. Well, I think most people, if they've heard about sarin gas attacks at all, they probably heard of the Tokyo subway sarin gas attack. That happened in March 1995. So less than a year later after By this. the same cult. Right. So in Tokyo... Members of this cult, Om Shinrikyo, or at least that's how I've always pronounced it. I've never actually heard it pronounced in Japanese. But yeah. Members of this cult released sarin gas in the Tokyo Metro during rush hour. Yes. And I'd heard of that. Everybody's heard of that. That was a super famous terrorist attack. Yeah. And this Matsumoto thing was basically a test for that one. Like they yeah. were rehearsing. Yeah. And Paul, I think maybe at some point we should probably do an episode on either the sarin gas attack, like really dig into that or the both cult. of them. We got to do an episode or, on the cult or the cult. We have, dude, I was or digging even, into it. I was like, we have to, or what if we just did Japanese cults in general? Cause they're, we had to do an episode for each, ones. each major cult. Each one. Okay. Like there's a whole episode on this cult. Sure. The chemical weapons program that these guys had was insane. They yeah. had whole industrial sized factories working to produce biological and chemical weapons that they were planning to use in attacks on people. It is crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. But I guess I'm, getting back to this incident a little yeah. bit, there's so much we could talk about, but seven victims died that night and another one died years later after being in a coma. So eight total deaths from this attack. 274 people were treated at local hospitals and probably a lot more suffered some level of effects, uh, but didn't immediately seek treatment. So I mentioned this was like a test for the Tokyo attack, but did you see any of their other motivations for this? Or like, why why did they do this? And why in Matsumoto? Uh, I've got a whole section about motive. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but I want to mention just a little bit more about like the effects first. Sure, sure. The next day when they went to the area, they found dead fish in ponds. They found dead dogs, dead birds, and all described as a large number of dead caterpillars. And leaves were discolored and grass was shrunken. Like it just annihilated about everything within a 150 meter radius of where they released it. I saw Saren described as an extremely toxic nerve agent. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I don't know a ton about the chemistry there or like what nerve agents are. But as far as I understand, attacks on the nerves are like the most painful and dangerous and like just really messed up. Right. Your nervous system is literally how you feel pain. Yeah. I actually, I had shingles at one point. And that's, you didn't know that? Oh my God. It was like, shingles is awful. It was like five years ago. It was awful. And that's nerve pain. You know, it's, it's attacking your nerves and it's just, 
I mean, it was one of the most intense forms of pain I've ever experienced in my life because Ugh. it doesn't go away. There's no way to get rid of that pain. No oatmeal know? bath is going to make you feel better from that one. Yeah. Damn. Glad you got over that. Me too. And it was right by my eye too, which is super dangerous because it can blind you if it gets into your eye. Ugh. Yep. People that were sleeping with open windows or people that had air conditioners running were especially affected because obviously the gas got into their apartments easier. And some of the victims even described seeing a fog floating by that had a really pungent, disgusting smell to it. Man. Yeah. That's crazy. They had so much of this. They released it in the open air outside, and it had this, it affected hundreds of people. Scary. Yeah. So we, let's talk about motive now. So the reason they went to this particular apartment building is because three judges lived here that the cult was expecting to rule against them in a real estate lawsuit that they had. So they were preemptively getting revenge on these judges. But there were other motives too. One was to test. We've got this sarin. Does it work? Can we effectively deliver it? Also, they were angry at the residents of Matsumoto because they had been trying to buy some real estate and build some cult development I saw in, an in Matsumoto. They were trying to build an office and a factory there. Yeah. And this part blew me away. There were 140,000 signatures collected on an anti Aum cult petition, which at the time equated 70% of Matsumoto's population. How many places even have that percentage of the population voting on anything? Right? You know? To get that many people to sign a thing? Like, they hated this cult. Yeah, clearly. And they were right, obviously. So there are other really wild parts of this, too. One of them is the investigation. After the incident, the police focused their investigation on a man named Yoshiyuki Kono. And his wife was the one in the coma affected mm. by this. They found a large number of pesticides in his residence. And even though it was later proven that you cannot make sarin from pesticides, they still, for whatever reason, focused on this guy. Wow. And a ton of newspapers named him, and he was dubbed the poison gas man. That's not and he cool. received death threats and hate mail, all while his wife was like suffering and in a coma and he was dealing with this. It was bad. When it came out after the Tokyo, they didn't realize until after the Tokyo attack that, oh, it was this cult that did it. That was when they finally figured it out. And uh, apparently all the major newspapers apologized to him. A lot of good that does. Which is so Japanese, right? Like, oh, we just ruined this guy's life. Oh, well, we'll deep bow and say we're sorry, and, and we'll do the same thing to the next guy probably, right? Like, that's just how it is sometimes. Um, the police chief also apologized to the guy. Rightfully so, right? But it gets even worse, Jason. So while they were focusing on this guy... The police received an anonymous tip that actually named the Ohm cult. And I saw an excerpt from this tip, and it literally says this. Matsumoto was definitely an experiment of sorts. The result of this experiment in an open space, seven dead, over 200 injured. If sarin is released in an enclosed space, say a crowded subway, it is easy to imagine a massive catastrophe. Prophetic. So police got that tip, still focused on the innocent guy, did nothing, and six months later, there's an attack in the Tokyo subway system. I mean, massive it doesn't surprise me failure a whole lot. of the Matsumoto police. How many tips did they get, though, about all sorts of different stuff? Well, here, here's the thing. If they would have done their research, I deep dove into this cult because I was interested. 
This cult was already under investigation. This cult was already suspected of dealing with biological and chemical weapons. They should have investigated and been able to put two and two together. It wasn't that hard. They screwed up really bad. Fair enough. I'm not going to question allegations of police screwing up. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you're, it's right up your alley. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, as far as consequences. Sure. 13 members of the cult, including the cult's leader, Shoko Asahara, were sentenced to death, and they were executed in 2018 mm-hmm. for this attack and the Tokyo one. And poor Mr. Kono's wife did eventually wake from her coma, mm. but she was never able to talk or move. Oh, man. And she ended up passing away, I think, in 2008. Ugh. Poor guy. Yeah, for real. But he got those apologies, so, you know. Oh, that makes everything better. Yeah. You know? mm. That's all I was going to say, even though I just talked for like 10 minutes straight. It was a little bit. But it goes so deep, bro. Yeah. Well, I have, I have one more interesting fact to add to that. Hit me. So this was an attack on the city of Matsumoto, right? Yeah. Did you know that, that the leader of the cult, Shoko Asahara, that wasn't his original name? That wasn't his real name? Yeah, I did, I did know this, yes. He made that name up for himself, and his original family name, Matsumoto. I did think that was odd. His name was Matsumoto Chizuo. So perhaps his attack on Matsumoto was also a symbolic attack on the person he used to be. Oh. Perhaps the act reflected a deep-seated self-hatred that drove his descent into increasingly radical ideologies and aspirations, ultimately culminating in his rebirth as the leader of a malevolent cult which would cast a shadow of terror and dread that would haunt the nation. Dude, that was awesome. Did you write that yourself? Of course you did. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. It was probably <laughs> just a coincidence. Well, I, what I was wondering is... Is that why they decided to try to build an office in Matsumoto? Probably just a coincidence. <laughs> it could. It I don't could, know. It could be. I don't know either, but it made me wonder. I noticed yeah, that too. It was just a weird very coincidence. Odd. Yeah. So that was quite the surprise. Like when I just said, let's do Matsumoto, I had zero idea that that was a thing. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on. So let's go to Matsumoto. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff to see there. Well, you know where we got to start, right? Well, yeah, but I wanted to just say like the, ba- the, the, the logistical stuff about how, you know, how to, how to start your trip, let's say. How to start your trip? Well, I mean, like, what, are you, what are you getting at? Like where you're going to arrive in Matsumoto. Okay, sure, sure, sure. You're probably going to get there by train and there's a train line that goes right through the downtown area. And you could get off at Matsumoto Station. That might seem like the logical thing because it's, you know, it's, it's got to be the main station, station right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to suggest we start at the next station, which is Kita Matsumoto. Okay. That means North Matsumoto. And it's just a little bit north of Matsumoto Station. So from this station, there's a bunch of stuff downtown that's all pretty walkable. And I only say we start at Kita Matsumoto so that we can kind of start at the north edge of the city and move down south and, you know, have minimal backtracking. Right? Sure. Yeah, because the castle's kind of like north downtown, right? Yes. Yeah. So actually the furthest north interesting thing I found is the former Kaichi School, but it's just a few blocks north of the castle. Like we, we pretty much have to walk past the castle to get there. Okay. So why don't we just start at the castle, right? Okay. So if you follow the road straight east from that station, Kita Matsumoto Station, we run into Matsumoto Castle. Beautiful castle. The outer walls are all black. I really like that. Well, they're all black, but they have like a little white panel at the top. Right. It's like just underneath the roof, there's kind of a little white strip. So it's an extremely unique look and very beautiful. It is. All that black actually gave it the nickname Karasujo, which means the Crow Castle. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of it as the emo castle. <laughs> that one caught me. I didn't <laughs> see that one coming. I saw a crow castle and I was thinking like Game of Thrones. Yeah, I get Yeah, yeah. Know, get like it's too. right by the mountains too, kind of like the wall. I don't totally, know. totally. Dude, did I tell you I subscribed to Max for a month with the 4K option so I can, I'm rewatching Game of Thrones as I read the book. 
Oh, like nice. I'm going chapter chapter by chapter, episode by episode. What do you do when you get to like season four and it goes off the rails? I'm just gonna watch the train wreck happen, you know. Okay. I'm gonna, but yeah, I gotta fair, say, fair it, enough. It's it's amazing how kind of bare bones the show feels when you've read the books. Like yeah. there's so much more detail. The books are are better, and I mean the show was great at the beginning too, of course. But anyway, I'm going off on this whole thing. Let's. I think we have a lot to talk about in this episode. <laughs> yeah. So it's unique, obviously, for the Black Walls. Um, another thing that makes it unique among the 12 remaining original castles in Japan is that it's six stories. Mm. I think only Himeji Castle is the only other one that's six stories. Okay. And I remember climbing all of them up. Yeah, that's a big one. Yep. It looks like five stories on the outside, but one of the floors is like a double floor mm. on the inside. Got to trick those ninjas. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's also unique for not being built on a hill. It's built in on the plain. The flat land castle. Yeah, so that's also very unique for, for Japanese castles as well. The wooden interiors and external stonework are original from over 400 years ago. Yep. And it's surrounded by a moat, which is pretty cool. And yes, I, yes. I've seen some incredible pictures where like the, it's, it must be a perfectly still calm night you know with no wind because the moat is just it looks like glass is perfectly reflective and then there's like a little crescent moon and uh just these pictures of like the castle and then it's perfect reflection in the moat it looks so freaking cool man it's like the overly photogenic castle yeah it's also unique in that it has the main keep and it has a second keep attached to it as well Hmm. and then a few years later they built another tower for moon viewing. Oh, cool. That was completed uh, in 1635. So that one, because that was in the time of peace now, it's like no defenses. The first two keeps are built like castle, like defenses. And then the third one was just like, "Eh, it's just a building we're throwing up. We're just looking at the moon. So it's really unique in that it's got the two kind of other buildings connected to the main keep. It's really cool looking. I don't know how many times I'm going to say it's cool looking. It is cool looking. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) I have another really fun piece of history about the castle, if I may. Yes, please. So in the late Meiji period, around the beginning of the 1900s, the castle keep started to lean to one side. Ah, yeah, I heard about that. Did you read about that? I did. Do you know why people thought that it was leaning? Like there was a theory of why it started leaning to the side. No, I didn't catch that. People thought it was because of a curse. Oh. The curse of Tadakasuke. Okay. I this have this some... should have gone in our urban legends episode. I know. This is pretty cool. So Tadakasuke, he was a farmer. He led an uprising in 1686 because they raised taxes by a lot. And it's not even actually clear if he meant to start an uprising because originally he just got together a bunch of farmers and they submitted a written appeal to the city magistrate, like saying, hey, we can't afford these taxes. But then when other peasants heard about that appeal, they flocked to the castle and basically started rioting. Yeah, all right. Yeah. People power. So within a few days, the executives in the castle, I don't think the Lord was even there. He was somewhere else. So these people had to like deal with this backlash. They signed documents saying, okay, yeah, we're going to lower the taxes. We, we give in to you guys. You know, everything's going to be cool. Wait, wait, wait. You're not going to tell me they didn't mean it, right? Believe it or not, they lied. Oh, man. Because a month later, Kosuke and his followers were arrested and executed without trial. Oh, man. Yeah. So this was a really big deal for the local community. And Kosuke, the guy that kind of started this whole thing, became like a symbol for the fight for human rights. Because basically, by raising the taxes to that point, they were telling people, like, you you don't get to live anymore. Yeah, you know, We can right. do whatever we want, and if you can't pay it, and you have no food to feed yourselves, well, That's your problem. Bad. Yeah. Um, so then, things started going badly for the Mizuno family. Those were the people that were in charge at the time. And when people saw things going badly for them, that's when the idea of this curse came up. Uh, and apparently, people were still talking about this curse more than 200 years later when the castle started leaning. And they're like, oh, it's the curse of (laughs) Kosuke. Did you see how they fixed the castle? No, but I have one more quick little thing. So there's actually a museum not far from here. 
uh, the Jokyo Gimin Memorial Museum. It commemorates that uprising. Oh, wow. And uh, technically, it's not in the city of Matsumoto. It's like five miles away from the castle, maybe. But you could take a train there if you wanted to learn more about that history. I do. Yeah. Okay. Add it to my list. I didn't have that. That's what you I was got talking me. about. I didn't have that one. When I said like the 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 community coming together and stuff, that was like a theme yeah. in my research, it felt like. Matsumoto is just one of these places where like, if you go search it online, you're going to find a million things about the castle. You're going to find hardly anything else. But if you really dig in, you just keep coming up with more cool stuff. True. Yeah. So the castle like was a legit castle. So if you go to the main keep, you will get to see all of the defense stuff that we talked about in the castles episode, like the little slit windows for the archers, the places where they drop boulders and hot liquids on people, the really steep staircases that are hard to climb, like all of that stuff is in this castle. Sweet. There's also some displays there, um, like museum wise. There's a whole bunch of firearms, like classic firearms, like the matchlock rifles and things that they were using in like the 1600s are on display at the castle. That'd be cool to see. I saw one picture at least of like a really old armor set that might have used to been the Lord's. Awesome. So lots of cool relics there uh, related to ancient warfare as well. Definitely. And you can climb all the way up. Get the nice views gotta of get the those beautiful views. castle park. It's got a whole park there. You mentioned the moat is is beautiful, and like I'm convinced that every single castle in Japan is a cherry blossom viewing spot. Yeah, it, it does this seem that way. Is also one. I believe it. <laughs> Tons of cherry trees all around. So if you're there in spring, doesn't that kind of clash with the emo castle idea though? Yeah, but in a good way, the black castle with the beautiful pink cherry blossoms? It is a good contrast. Oh, man, that's nice. Just the cherry blossoms don't feel moody enough. Unless, I guess, you could think of like the cherry blossom symbolism of death, right? The, the cherry blossoms are like the blood. It's like bleeding. The transience of the petals is like the, what is it? The, the myriad petals are, are like are the dying. Are you feeling emo today, Jason? Are you going to write us a poem about your suffering? Maybe. Okay. I had a bad day at work. Let, let, let me know if you want to jump in with a poem. All right. So, as I mentioned, just a few blocks north from the castle, we'll find the former Kaichi School. Did you read anything about this, Paul? No. All right. Let me blow your mind. It's a very pretty school. It was built in 1876. And the reason it's important and worth visiting is because it was the first community school in the region and one of the first in the country. Really? Yeah. So before this school was built, only the children of samurai got higher education and normal kids were educated by monks at primary schools that were like affiliated with local Buddhist temples. But this school brought higher education to the masses as the national education system was being reformed at the beginning of the Meiji period. So this new system was modeled after Western education systems, and you can really see the Western influence in the design of the building, too. So these days, it's a museum. Uh, in 2019, it was designated a national treasure. Ooh. Sounds very cool, but it's currently temporarily closed due to seismic reinforcement work. Ah. Uh. But it, it opens pretty soon. It's it's reopening in May of 2024. This okay. Year. Now that you said that, I feel like I I clicked on it and like saw that it was closed and was like, oh, I won't look into it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. By the time we get back to Japan, it'll be open again. Sweet. So now that we've seen the school, let's walk back south past the castle again. Now that it's a few hours later, maybe we can get more pictures of the castle with the sun in a different position, you know? I bet you will. I absolutely <laughs> will. Uh, and we're going to continue past the castle. Only about a block away is a soba shop called Takagi that I wanted to stop at. Okay. Because they have a soba class where you can make your own soba noodles. Ooh, that sounds nice. Doesn't that sound fun? I, I like, like making your own fresh food. Yeah, interactive stuff like that's always good. I was looking at the reviews. 
To be honest, the reviews are kind of middling on the food at this restaurant. Okay. I get the impression that it's like a really touristy place and maybe rests on its laurels a bit. Okay. That's the impression I got. Well, I'm going to say, hey, not their fault you don't make your own soba noodles very good. (laughs) I mean, they have a restaurant too. You can just like go eat at the (laughs) restaurant, but you know, it's so close to the castle. Like they just, they get customers no matter what they do. But the reviews specifically about the soba making experience, those all sounded pretty great. So like just the opportunity to have that kind of experience, I think is really interesting. Sure. Exciting. So just about a block and a half south from there, you'll find the Matsumoto City Museum. If you have a ticket to Matsumoto Castle, you will also be able to get into the museum with that ticket. For free? Yeah. Nice. Well, I mean, you already paid for the ticket, but yes. Well, sure. But without additional charge. You may have thought that you were just paying that to go to the castle. So this is effectively free. Yeah. It's a museum showing local history of Matsumoto going back thousands of years, way back in time. Um, there's a really cool diorama I saw of the old castle town, what it looked like back in the Edo period. So I, I always love seeing those. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. It's not a huge, it's not a huge place. So now if we walk another block south, notice all of these things are really close together. Like this is super walkable. Yeah. Uh, just before we cross the Metoba River, we're going to find Nawate Shopping Street, which I saw described in one review as a very adorable shopping street. <laughs> the theme here is frogs. Yes. Its nickname is Frog Street. Yeah, because this area right by the river, they used to have a ton of frogs, and you would hear them croaking as you walked by. There's actually a frog statue at the entrance to the street. A really cool frog statue. Did you see it? Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. And there's a bunch of frogs everywhere. There's frog souvenirs, little frog statues, little frog everything. I like frogs. Me too. Yeah, it looks fun. They have cafes, specialty shops, souvenir shops, little stalls. I hear it's a good place to get pottery. Yeah. And it has kind of an old-fashioned look to it. Nice atmosphere. It seems to kind of feel more like a quaint small town type shopping street. Yeah. Like it doesn't it doesn't look like the big covered modern shopping streets you see in a lot of big cities. You yeah, know? it's like old timey. Yeah, very charming. Yeah. On the other side of the river, there's another shopping street called Nakamachi Street. This one's known for its kura, traditional storehouses some of which are over 100 years old. Yeah. Good place to buy traditional handicrafts like pottery, lacquerware, and wooden crafts. And they also have cafes, restaurants, soba shops. Maybe at this point it's time for lunch. Yeah. That'd be a good place to stop. There's also Ryokan here. On this street? You can stay on the street? Yeah. That's cool. So that could be a possible hotel choice for you. Nice. One of the most popular spots on this street is the Karasikan. Karasik? Khan, pronounce oh, something like that. Read what, about that. What's that? It's a restored sake brewery oh. and warehouse from the late 1800s that you can explore. You can go in there and wander oh, around. Nice. There's even a small Japanese garden and a little tea room cafe type place in there. Sweet. Yep. And just west of there is the Matsumoto Timepiece Museum. Yeah. This place looks really unique, uh, which I think makes it kind of cool. Uh, on the exterior of the building is the largest pendulum clock in Japan. Wow. It looks like it's about two stories tall. It has this huge pendulum that just swings back and forth. Do you have a number for how long that pendulum is? I do not. Oh, man, Paul. Do you? No. Okay. But I didn't do any research on this place, so. Well, I said like two stories tall. I mean, okay. So I'd throw like 20 feet-ish out there. Sure. <laughs> It's funny too, because it's like not a small clock face, but there's like a clock face that's got like the hand or whatever. And then there's this this massive 20 foot pendulum underneath it swinging back and forth. Is the pendulum, it's not just out in the open air, is it? No, it's like enclosed. It's like kind of like recessed into the building and then like glass in front of it, I think. Got it. So it's a three story museum. The first two floors are the permanent collection. And then there's rotating timepieces of various themes from around the world that are displayed on the third floor. Wow. I wonder if they, do you think they have like really cool cuckoo clocks in there? Yes. Oh, that does sound pretty cool. They've got 
um, exhibits linked to specific professions like train conductor watches or nurse watches from like back in the day. Wow. Um, they've also got timepieces from European countries, Asian countries. They've got grandfather clocks. They've got old clocks. They've got new clocks. They've got quirky clocks. They've even got sundials. Oh, cool. <laughs> I guess that is a timepiece. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, you know, you probably won't spend more than an hour there, but it just seems like a really unique, cool place to go see. Yeah, definitely. A real novelty. Yeah. So, so far, everything's been, I mean, like super close together, like less than a two block walk from one thing to the next. Yeah. Now we're going to head southeast a little bit further, maybe a 10, 15 minute walk. That's not bad. No, not at all. We're going to head over to the Matsumoto City Museum of Art. Oh, great. An art museum is my normal attitude. (laughs) Okay. But this place looks amazing. I know. I know. I'm I'm uncultured. Yeah. I, I, I like I like music, but like going staring at paintings is not generally my thing. Sure. But this place is cool. Are you excited because of the collection of works by Yayoi Kusama? Yes. She's pretty cool. I am amazed by her artwork, dude. I love it. It looks so awesome. So let me back up just a little bit. Uh, the museum has a bunch of exhibitions focusing on local artists or on artists that were inspired by the local area but the most popular attraction is their collection of of stuff by yayoi kusama she's a very famous artist we've actually mentioned her before on the podcast because we were talking about naoshima yeah maybe she her made most... the pumpkin yeah that's I probably feel like so many people have seen that pumpkin on naoshima island i think that's what she's most famous for and it, it's not even just a single pumpkin she's made a bunch of pumpkins that was like a whole era of her artistic journey or whatever yeah so yeah they have some sculptures at naoshima some of her pumpkins did you know i read that one of them like was washed away into the sea at one point oh they had no to go recover it and bring it back oh no i know there's one that's like right on the edge of the ocean yeah yeah she uses extremely bright vivid colorful styles and just the way she uses colors blows me away it just pops yeah. So hard. Striking for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So she's originally from Matsumoto, mm-hmm. but her works can be found all across the country now. Real famous. Her style could be described as avant garde. And if you want to see her stuff, this is a good place to do that. Yeah. She's got a large sculpture out front. She's got a ton of work inside. I want to yeah, go. Yeah. I mean, out of all the art museums around, this seems like a pretty cool one. They also have a lot of calligraphy from a famous artist, Shizan Kamijo. I think it would be really cool to see a, like a Japanese calligraphy exhibit. Yeah. Especially, oh man, did I tell you? I've been watching this anime that was recommended to me by someone on the, on the Discord. It's yeah. called Barakamon. Have you heard of that? It sounds familiar, but I, I'm not sure. It's kind of, it's, I mean, it's not super recent or anything, but it's about a calligraphist. That goes to like live on this island to kind of revive his creative spirit. Or whatever. Okay, definitely haven't seen it. Well, it's cool. Like it, you know, you see examples of calligraphy and stuff. Nice. I feel like calligraphy would be a good uh, juxtaposition to like the super bright, colorful art. And then you go see like black and white calligraphy. That's yeah. really beautiful. That's kind of cool yeah. too. Like modern art and traditional art. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's excited as you're, ever going to hear me about an art museum. <laughs> All right. I looked at a bunch of pictures people took at this place, and I, I just thought it was super cool. It does seem cool. I'm excited for us to go to Matsumoto. I know, dude. I know. <laughs> so if we follow the road east just a few more minutes from the museum, we end up in Agata no Mori Park. Mm-hmm. What's up with this park, Paul? You had it on your list, and it wasn't on mine, so what's oh. special about it? Oh, okay. Um... Two main things are special about it. One is that there's this really beautiful um, walking path that's lined with Himalayan cedar trees. Are those different from other cedar trees? Uh, It's a subspecies, I guess. Okay. But it's really cool. It's just a walking path and it's straight and like the trees are just boom, lined up along it. Really beautiful park. 
But the thing that really sets this park apart is that there's an early 1900s high school on the park grounds that's no longer used. But it is now um, a civic center. Hmm. So they use it for civic activities. But Classroom 1-1 and the principal's office are recreated as they were in the early 1900s. Awesome. So you can go in there and see this like super old school Meiji era high school. They even have a couple mannequins wearing the uniforms that students would have been wearing at the time. Huh. So it just seemed like a really cool thing to see. Yeah. Um, there's also like a small lake and a walking path. It's just a, like a breath of green air in the middle of the city that you also get to see this kind of really cool historical place. You convinced me. Maybe I'm more into it too because of all the anime I've watched that centers on like high schools. Like I want to go see an oh. high school, you know? Are there animes that have centered on high school in the early 1900s? Well, yeah. Any of that. Any anime based in the early 1900s is probably out of I haven't seen there. any like historical anime like there, that. There's a few. All right, he'll have to show me. Yeah. So at this point, we spent a lot of time in the downtown area. I mean, I think that's probably enough to fill up a day pretty well. Yeah. But maybe the next day, we want to get to some interesting places in other parts of the city. So the rest of the things we're going to talk about, these are kind of spread out, like pretty, pretty spread out. So you might want to prioritize like whatever specific things you're most interested in. It's going to take a while to get out to each one of these. And not there's not really a quick, easy way to get in between them. I feel like though, though you you got I always gotta think to myself, like, oh, if there's not a train station running right to something, I'm like, oh, it's hard to get to. But then I think like, okay, people spend time in Tokyo though. And even though there's train stations everywhere, it takes you 50 minutes to get across the city sometimes. Yeah. Like there's nothing here that's going to take you more than 50 minutes to get to. Sure. I mean, you can get around. It's yeah. just going to take a little longer than like yeah. walking a block or two. Yeah, exactly. You're right. You're right. So where are we going first? Well, if we're in the mood to take a break and rest our weary bones, we could head north and a little bit east of the downtown area. That would get us to Asama Onsen. Okay. A hot spring resort with a history that dates back at least 1,300 years. Ooh, wow. It was apparently further popularized in the Edo period when that same guy that constructed Matsumoto Castle, or like, you know, finished it, to built it into what it is today. Yeah. He also constructed a bathhouse here, and part of that bathhouse still remains as a bathing facility. Nice. Isn't that cool? Nice. One of the oldest onsen buildings, I would think, that you can... Hang out in. Yeah. There's also a ryokan that you can stay in. They have indoor and outdoor baths. So nice. that all sounds wonderful. Ah, uh, outdoor onsen, dude. I miss it. Uh, I know. It's only been, what, like seven months since we've been in Japan, but it oh, feels man. like an eternity. <sighs> Just having access to that every night. Oh, dude, that, that was, was the best. best. Nico was amazing. Yeah. I still got to learn how to say Nico. 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 No one understands me when I say Nico. Yeah. <laughs> Working on it. If we want to head east of downtown, we can find the Matsumoto Minge Khan Folk Art Museum. This is a somewhat small museum, but it shows folk art from around the world. There is a bunch of glassware and pottery. There are some really cool looking masks. And one thing that a lot of people I saw commented on were Edo era shop signs that they had on display. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. They had textiles, statues, just a whole bunch of stuff packed all over, all over the, the little museum. That, that, that's all. <laughs> sounds cool. And I want to mention this. I'm not going to, we're not going over like hours of everything, but I swear to you, did you notice that almost every single place in Matsumoto says closed on Mondays? I did not notice Even that. the shopping streets said closed on Mondays. Huh. This place is closed on Mondays. Everything's closed on Mondays. If you get in Matsumoto on a Monday, like go hiking or something, because nothing's going to be open in the city. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to the opening hours. A bit south and a little bit east from downtown, we're going to find Koboyama Kofun. Yeah. 
We've talked about Kofun before. Yes. These are massive ancient burial mounds, many of which you can't access, but this one, you actually can. Yeah. You just climb up it. I don't know. That just sounds so cool to me. It's just this ancient burial mound that's huge. Like, I can't believe they built these things. I know. Well, they haul bucket by bucket up on this thing to build these huge 100-foot tall hills? They're it's massive. crazy. Yeah. They're key-shaped. This uh, one's not really key-shaped, though. This one's a little different. Not anymore, at least. I don't know if it was or not. It's, it's like a hill. I, I think I saw that the style of this one... Like, there are other similar shaped ones that, oh, okay. that are separate from the keyhole shaped ones. I didn't but see that. I got a little bit of detail here. So, this one is estimated to date back to the 3rd or 4th century. Oh, man. It was excavated in 1974 when they found a burial chamber, which contained a sarcophagus, which contained some treasures like a mirror, swords, spearheads, a cauldron, Ooh. and some other stuff. Always mirrors. Yeah, mirrors are, are big treasures that's so cool man. that's so cool yeah and if you want to see some of these artifacts you can actually head a bit further south about a mile and a half they have the matsumoto municipal archaeological museum where they have some of the artifacts on display so it sounds i mean if you like archaeology and ancient history stuff it sounds awesome yeah. they have a huge collection of really great pottery dating back all the way to the jamon period where they had all those rope indentations on the pottery that looked mm. super cool. Yeah. Seemed like a really, really fun museum. And from on top of the Kofun, you kind of get a nice view of the city too. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I bet. A few miles west of downtown is the Japan Ukiyoe Museum. This is another really unique Matsumoto thing, right? I guess. So we're talking about woodblock prints from the Edo period. Yeah, these were a popular style of Japanese art in the Edo period, and they have a ton of them here. I mean, so many. This is actually the largest private collection of ukiyo-e paintings, screens, and old books in the world. They have over 100,000 pieces. Yes, not all on display, but the, the collection is that big. That's huge. This collection was started by a man named Sakai Yoshiaki about 300 years ago in the Edo era. That's when he started collecting these? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so he was one of the wealthy merchants in the area, and he started a collection. And since then, his family has kept growing it up to the 100,000 that it is today. That's so cool. So it's just a really, really great snapshot into that era of art. Yeah. Man, here I'm getting excited about art again. <laughs> there you go. What's going on, dude? Yeah, it does sound really cool, though. I've never seen any... Have I seen any ukiyo-e, like, in person? I'm trying to remember. I am, too. Maybe. I definitely haven't seen a place that's specialized in it. Yeah. So if you make it out here to this museum, there's another thing right next to it that you can also visit. Oh, it what's that? I cool. missed this. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a local history museum right next to... The Ukiyo-e Museum. It's I missed a history museum? It's called what? the Matsumoto City Rekishi no Sato Museum. The building was actually erected as a court building in the Meiji period. Okay. And it's the only wooden court building remaining in Japan. That's a very interesting fact. Very specific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they have a ton of info here about local history. And I saw a review that said that you can get a discount if you bring a ticket stub from the Ukiyo-e Museum. Oh, nice. Yeah. Efficiency. Always good to save some money. So that's all the stuff I have in the city of Matsumoto. However, I mean, there are a bunch of cool day trips you can do from Matsumoto, but there's one specific one that I'm very excited about. Gets me excited. <laughs> It does. <laughs> okay. So this is just like, it's, us. it's just right outside Masmoda. It's, it's pretty close by, and I think it's worth visiting. We have, we've actually talked about this before. We have. It's called Dayo Wasabi Farm. And it's amazing. Wasabi is, of course, that spicy green stuff. You've probably seen it served with sushi, or at least a fake version of it served with sushi. Yes. If you want to hear about why most wasabi is fake, go listen to episode 57. Fake! About wasabi. <laughs> And will turn you into a wasabi snob. Definitely. But they grow wasabi here at the Dayo Wasabi Farm, despite the fact 
that is widely considered to be the single most difficult plant to cultivate. We also talked about that in episode 57. Yeah. So there's so much cool stuff about this place. I mean, for one, it looks beautiful. They have these water mills that were actually used in a Kurosawa film. You can walk through the wasabi fields. I thought that was really interesting about the water mills is that they're not there to do anything. They were literally built for the movie. <laughs> okay, I forgot about that. They were built, like they didn't exist until they yeah, made them for the movie. they built them for the movie. Yeah, but they, they kept they, them there They're just like still there because they look great. Yeah, okay. But yeah, like uh, it's a, over a hundred year old farm and there's like a stream that runs through the farm and then they divert the stream through all these little canals so that all of the wasabi gets this pure fresh mountain stream water that's one of the reasons they can grow wasabi here is that the water is so pure and good that's essential like we talked in episode 57 about how wasabi requires that super pure spring water it has to be the perfect temperature and it has to be perfectly clear and if it's not It'll all die. Yeah. We're better to have a wasabi farm than in a valley surrounded by the Japanese Alps, some of the tallest peaks in the country. Exactly. But Paul, you know what I'm most excited about with this place, right? Wasabi ice cream? All the wasabi flavors. And wasabi stuff. everything? Dude, how, what do you think I'm most excited about? Uh, I mean, it, it'd have to be the wasabi beer, I think. Yes, you got it. <laughs> it had to be something vegan. <laughs> Doesn't that sound amazing, though? Yes, I definitely want to try wasabi beer. Also, I saw they have wasabi juice, which I'm like... Juiced wasabi? It says wasabi juice is what I saw. I'm like morbidly curious about what that is. I'm going to buy one of everything in their gift shop, you know? I got to try their wasabi pickles, wasabi noodles, wasabi sausages. Dude, wasabi croquettes. Does that not sound good? That sounds good. Oh, man. But what about the wasabi chocolate? Yeah. It's probably not vegan chocolate. But probably not. Yeah, the chocolate, the ice cream. I want the wasabi flavored everything. But this is, also, this is a great farm, but it's also designed for tourists. So there's these really nice walking paths all the way through it. There's displays that teach you about wasabi farming. And there's restaurants there, too, that are open for lunch. So you could stop and have a full meal. And or they just you just serve every everything wasabi. Yeah. Or you can just fill up on all the snacks. Yeah. And then there's a gift shop that's got everything wasabi. It's Dude. it's like a can't miss place if you're in the area, I feel like. To be honest, on my list of like individual attractions that I want to see in Japan, yeah. this one is really close to the top. Really? Yes. Would you put this above Matsumoto Castle? Oh, man, don't make me choose. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. I think I would. Wow. I'm very excited about the castle, but all those wasabi things, I want to eat all of them. That's, I'm just, I need to do that. Okay. I feel you. I mean, I'd probably say the castle first, but keep in mind that I can't eat 90% of the stuff they sell at this farm. That's so that might be influencing my decision. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait to see that gift shop. I'm going to buy so much stuff. I also saw that there's a really nice bike ride. If you rent a bike, it takes like a little bit out of the city, but you can get up to that river. And then there's like a really nice bike path that leads all the way like straight up to the farm. And it's like a 30 minute bike ride or something. Dude, you can bike from the city to the farm? Yes. Oh, we're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What what a day that'd be. We're about to replan our whole itinerary for our trip next right? year. Oh, oh man. man. Yeah. Is this like the Kagoshima episode? We did that, and I was just like, we have to go. <laughs> I know. Bro, we have to go. Well, this isn't super far from one of the other ideas we were throwing around, right? We were kind of talking about going through Nagano and down the I think it'd Sea be of cool Japan coast. To go to Takayama, too. Yeah. I mean, I've been to Shirakawa, which yeah. is similar in a lot of ways to Takayama, but you haven't seen any of that stuff. I haven't. And those, uh, the Gasho Zukuri farmhouses, yeah, those I are know, so cool. I know. It's like, it's kind of like a must-see, right? Yeah. Also, I mean, but we were talking about Kyushu, too, like Western Kyushu, and the more I look into Nagasaki, I really want to go to Nagasaki. I know. 
maybe we can well, make both work. We got plenty more years for uh, I know, for a I bunch know. of trips. It's just so hard to choose the next trip. I know. Because there's a million things we want to see. Yeah. Oh, man. One of the people on the Discord is doing the uh, Shimanami Kaido. Yeah, I saw that. So and jealous. You were just like triggered. Like, I want to go back. Yeah. Yeah, you got to check out our Discord. There's so much cool Japan discussions happening there. Yep. And uh, the wasabi farm is free. But they're going to get you because you're going to buy like a million wasabi things. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I'll give them all my money. Worth it. Um, that's the last thing I've got in Matsumoto. Me too. We should probably talk. There's about... all, like you said, there's all the day trips. There's all the hiking. There's all sorts of other things you can do like that. If you want to base yourself out of Matsumoto. But this is like the city area stuff. Yeah. So we should talk about how to get to and around the city, perhaps. Yep. I think I mentioned very early on, it's just under three hours by train from Tokyo. Um, I called it around two and a half. Okay. You can either take the Shinkansen through Nagano and transfer to a local train. I think there's also a different like local train that just kind of goes more straight to Matsumoto. But it's almost the same time, which other, which one you do. So, okay, the train from Shinjuku Station is a limited express. Yeah. About two and a half hours. If you take the Shinkansen, it takes about the same amount of time, but it costs a little bit more. You could get to Matsumoto by local JR trains, but I would not recommend it. That would take like five hours and three <laughs> transfers. Yeah. Another option is a highway bus. There are buses between Shinjuku Station and Matsumoto Station, and they leave every hour. Oh, wow. That's not bad. Yeah. And it only takes about three hours, and it's actually the cheapest option in most cases. So that might actually be... Three-hour bus ride's not bad. Like, those are comfy buses. Yeah, those highway buses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's for sure. And you can even book discount tickets online for the bus. So I don't know. Maybe we should take that. Yeah. I'd be down. Once you're in Matsumoto, like we said, it's pretty walkable. Even outside the downtown area, the interesting stuff is generally pretty close to the train lines. Yeah. So probably no need to rent a car unless you plan to get out into the mountains. And there are a lot of mountains that surround the city. Yeah. It's got that nice north-south train line. And then there is the electric railway running west from the downtown area as well. And there's a whole bunch of local bus routes too. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. We need to get there. I know. It's pretty high on my list. Like I said, hidden gem. But doesn't every city jump to the top of our list once we do an episode about it? I don't know if I can deny that, but most of the cities we've done, I've been to. Yeah, we need to branch out more. Hiroshima? I haven't. Yeah, That's yeah. the only one coming to mind that we've done an episode on that I haven't been to. Is that higher than uh, Matsumoto now? No, Matsumoto, I'd say, is higher. All right. Hiroshima's like one of the biggest attractions in Japan, I would say. That's one of the big ones, but Matsumoto, man, it's giving me Kagoshima vibes, and I adore Kagoshima. I get it. Well, Paul, uh, I got a surprise for you. Okay. A couple surprises, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, the first one is, uh, we didn't have time to, to get this into uh, the episode before Christmas, but uh, we got a Christmas gift from a certain listener oh longtime listener and friend of the podcast josh spiro oh josh he has sent us a package that is sitting right over there under the tree what you want to open it oh yes i do i am opening the package i think you got to open it last time didn't you (laughs) it's okay i can watch i always get to open them jason oh my god well, don't keep it to yourself. What's in there? There's a drawing and a note. Dude, Josh is a great artist. I don't know if you've seen his stuff on Instagram. He posts so much great stuff. Santa Claus. That's an awesome Santa. Oh, also, please notice what it says on the side of the box there. The other side. The side facing away from you. Yeah, I'm like, you don't want me to read your address, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, that's katakana. I was going to say, how's your katakana uh, these days? Not as good as my hiragana. What does it say, Jason? It says, Merry Christmas. I should have guessed that. <laughs> Excellent penmanship, by the way. Here's, here's the note. What does it say? Hey, guys. Sorry for the huge delay sending this package. The two of you will have to fight over who gets what. Oh, no. I get first choice. 
Looking forward to new episodes, hopefully coming soon. Merry Christmas. Nice. What a sweet letter. He said I get to pick. I don't think it's... Let me see it. Nah, I need the, to read yeah, this. Yeah, I, I already read it I for need to you. look at the picture more closely. Uh, just, just, just Don't read it. Oh, you missed the PS on the back that says, PS, uh, everything is for Jason, and Paul, you can suck it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Josh wouldn't say that. Wow, look at the detail in Santa's eye. Did you see that? Yes. That's awesome. Oh, it says Merry Christmas in Katakana on here, too. Yep. That's why I read it like that. Oh, got it. You're a Ghibli fan, right, oh, Jason? Oh, dude, it's Totoro. <laughs> it is. That's so cool. And he wiggles. I love and that. he wiggles. Is it one of the ones that, like, uh, with sunlight, you know, it's light that, that does it? Yeah, it looks like it has a little solar panel out yeah, there. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. That's mine, right? You're not that big into Ghibli. You're taking a gamble if you're, if you're picking that. You, oh, don't know, no. you don't know what else okay, is in here. Okay, we got to see everything first. Oh. Oh, it's another Ghibli thing, and you don't like Ghibli, so I get both of them, right? What? No, I like this movie. <laughs> This is, uh, I don't know his name. See, you don't even know his name. Does he have a name? Yeah, it's No Face. He's got a face. Oh, it's No Face. Okay, it's No Face. From Spirited Away, the big creature that devours everything. Yeah. We got some Puchow candies, I think. Oh, there's so much in here, dude. Tayaki. Strawberry, looks like, maybe? Yeah, strawberry. Nice. Oh, this tasty. one is brown. Coffee or chocolate, maybe? This one says Choco, chocolate. Got some sweet corn pretz, kind of like Pocky. Yeah, yeah, I like those. Those are good. Some high chews, can't go wrong Heck with yeah. those. Is high chew vegan? I think so. Oh, I, thought was, I was hoping there was gelatin in there or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have the uh, Kit Kat. Okay. Is, is it a matcha one? It's green, so I think you got a good shot at Where that. Oh, we got a little Pokemon uh, cracker cake. Sweet. Oh, another Kit Kat? Chocolate, perhaps? Dude, does Josh have a Japanese market near him or something? I don't know how he got all this stuff. Another Kit Kat, Melon Kit Kat. Ooh, that yeah. sounds good. I love melon flavored anything. Matcha Pocky. Delicious. Freaking love Pocky. And a Mobile Suit Gundam Machine Head. Ooh. And another one. So we each get one. Oh, sweet. Are they even like random so we can just... Does yours have this picture on it? Yes. Okay, so maybe they're just random. Ah, they're like, gotcha. Awesome. That was a heck of a grab bag. Oh my gosh, yeah. there's so much stuff in there. Thank you so much, Josh. That this is, is awesome. really nice. Thanks, Josh. Well, Paul, I got one more surprise for you. Okay. This is my uh, Christmas gift to you. Thanks, buddy. Let's see what's in here. It is Japan related. Okay. Okay. So I thought it made sense to open it on the pod. My gift to Jason was awesome, by the way, but it's not Japan related. So it was awesome. It was. I'm struggling this. I'm ripping this paper into a million pieces right now. Kaneko Okinawa whiskey? Where'd you find right? this? I got it at Total Wine, but I, when I saw Okinawa whiskey, I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Since and, 1846, the yeah. oldest distillery at Okinawa. Right. So when the distillery first opened, they were making Awamori, which is like a traditional uh, alcoholic beverage in Okinawa. And then recently, the current you know, youngest generation owner of the place uh, decided to turn it into a whiskey distillery or at least branch out into whiskey. I forgot. I forgot if I read that on the box or if I Googled it or something. Does it talk about their history? Yeah, in 2019, they decided to start uh, making whiskey. Yeah, so it's curious to see what Okinawa whiskey tastes like. Unique flavor that is true to the Ryukyu Island. I'm very curious too. Thank you, Jason. This is a truly unique gift. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy it. I, I'm sure I will. Well, before we go, we should thank our Shogun-level patrons, Wesley C., Paula, Nicholas McKibben, Kevin Harris, Brady K., Jack, and Katerina and Ellery listening in Albuquerque. Thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate you. You're, you're finally able to control yourself when saying Nicholas McKibben's name. <laughs> Nicholas McKibben! That's still how I hear it in my mind every time you say it. <laughs> It's a good name. It is. Uh, and for everyone who's not a member, please consider joining the Patreon. But if you don't have a few bucks to throw our way each month, you can also help us by telling a friend. We all know people who have been talking about maybe visiting Japan, people who watch a whole lot of anime, people who, who are into Japanese culture, you know. And, and we would love it if they could enjoy the podcast too. So please let them know we exist. Just a friendly reminder. 
when we get 50 patrons, you're getting that hentai episode. <laughs> Let's aim for our, our first goal of 25 patrons first. I got my sights set high, Jason. It's not just that I, don't I want blame to talk you. about hentai or anything. I think it's mostly that. I've never even researched it at all. I don't know why. I don't know anything about it. That joke is getting old, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody believes you. <laughs> plausible deniability bro yeah well paul what's coming up next time on the next episode we are going to be deep diving into japanese train stations we are jason's not super excited yet but i'm just confused about what i'm supposed to research for this this is paul's idea okay and uh i mean i'm sure i'll have to go like send you an outline or something Yeah, yeah, you can put together the outline for this. Let me go. Now that we got this one recorded, I'll go dive in. All right. But I I think it's going to be really cool. Japanese train stations are incredibly unique, and they're they're unlike anything quite else in the world. I mean, that's true. Japan's train system is amazing. I just feel like we've talked about it a lot already. Doing a great job pumping everybody up for the the next one. (laughs) My bad. But I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of fascinating stuff if we start digging into the train stations themselves instead of like the trains and the yeah. efficiency. They're and, way more than just train stations. They're like whole underground malls and everything. True. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.